Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And thank you to the Aspen Institute in Romania for putting this uh, Aspen dialogue, dialogue series together and inviting me to uh, moderate this webinar. My name is Andrew Robel and I am the founding partner at Emerging Europe, a London-based intelligence and community and news platform uh, whose mission is to foster uh, social and economic uh, and democratic growth of uh, Central and Eastern Europe in a sustainable way. Uh, my guests today are Ambassador Baiba Braje, uh, Assistant Secretary General for Public Diplomacy at the North Atlantic um, uh, Treaty Organization, and uh, Maros, uh, Maros Shevchovic, uh, Vice President for Interinstitutional um, Relations and Foresight at the European uh, Commission. Welcome to the Aspen Institute uh, Dialogue Series. So, uh, I hope you can hear me and we can already uh, start. Fantastic. So uh, I think that Bill um, Gates quote from about five years ago uh, about the world not being prepared for a pandemic like that has recently been re repeated plenty of times. Uh, but of course, we cannot turn back time. And what we can do going forward is to learn our lessons and uh, increase our resilience and uh, foresight in as many areas as, as, as possible. And this is what I would like to focus on uh, today in today's um, discussion. But before we start, I would like to invite uh, both my guests to uh, deliver opening remarks. And I will start with uh, Ambassador Braje. The floor is yours, Ambassador. Thank you very much, Andrew. And many thanks to the Aspen Institute Romania and the GMF office in Bucharest for inviting me to take part in this webinar. Uh, it's great to see the Vice President of the Commission with us. Let me start by thanking our host. Uh, Romania plays uh, such an important role in NATO. It's such a trusted NATO ally. It makes essential contributions to our collective security. Even in the current COVID crisis, Romanian military has been able to uh, provide military personnel and help save lives at home and abroad, including in Italy, in the US, in Moldova, and so have done many allies. So I'm very glad uh, that it has been possible. I'm also very glad to be able to share this digital platform uh, with all of you, and especially with uh, one of our closest counterparts, uh, the Vice President of the European Commission, Ambassador Shevkovic. The EU is a unique and essential partner for NATO, and the current crisis has further reinforced the importance of our cooperation and partnership. So the issue of resilience now and in the future, obviously, is certainly an important subject and part of very important debate. So the pandemic is teaching us the hard way that we need to make our institutions, our nations, our societies more resistant to threats and attacks. We need to ensure that they are able to bounce back from a crisis like this and that we are stronger after it. So resilience, in my view, is like a muscle. It needs to be trained to be kept strong. So that's why NATO has been working for many years to strengthen the resilience of our allies. And actually, we did it long before the outbreak of the COVID-19. Uh, as you know, Article 3 of NATO's founding treaty clearly states that resilience is part of responsibilities of NATO allies. So it's our duty to make sure that societies are resilient. Back in 1949, uh, it was obviously about being resilient to armed attacks, more specifically. But currently, in current security environment, it requires us to be resilient to a range of hybrid threats and hybrid attacks, and even to health pandemics. So this means we all have to adapt to ensure that our nations and our populations can better resist, can better recover from shocks, and from these uh, type of situations. And one way to answer it is to work together. We work together as countries, as institutions, as people, as public and private sector, as military and civilian personnel. Already in 2016, NATO leaders agreed to a set of baseline requirements 
for national resilience. And that's a term that might sound strange, but what it means, it helps allies to ensure preparedness across the whole of government, including in the health sector. So that even under the most uh, demanding circumstances, we have the continuity of the government, that we have continuity of essential services to the population, that we have civilian support to the military, so that there is a whole of government, whole of society effort. Right now, with this pandemic, our resilience is being tested like never before, in my view. On the one hand, we are doing well. So allies prove they are resilient, they are united in the face of the global challenge. Our nations are cooperating and, and providing critical supplies to those most, most in need. So hundreds of tons of medical equipment has been donated and developed, delivered. Allies are sharing medical expertise, spare hospital capacity. Uh, thousands of military medical personnel have been deployed in support of civilian efforts. But on the other hand, it's clear that more work needs to be done to further strengthen uh, resilience of our societies. So we need to better plan for pandemics in the future. So we need to protect our critical infrastructure. We need to improve our business continuity planning. And again, that is a concern for all of us. It's both in the public and in the private sector. We can do better. And that is why when defense ministers uh, of NATO met in April, they agreed a set of recommendations to strengthen our resilience. So that is still further. So we are now bolstering our civil preparedness based on the lessons from the crisis. And we are working even closer with our international partners, countries and organizations. So obviously the EU and the UN uh, are the ones with whom we cooperate the closest. Because ultimately, training only one muscle doesn't make the whole body stronger. Resilience is very much a collective effort. So one area where we need to gather even more is on countering disinformation and propaganda. We are seeing state and non-state actors exploiting the current situation to further their own interests. Potential adversaries are using disinformation to try to sow division, undermine our societies, undermine our democracies. We are also seeing uh, disinformation uh, directly aimed at uh, trust and eroding trust in NATO's troops. For example, in April, a fake letter was sent in the Secretary General's name claiming that NATO would withdraw its troops from Lithuania. There have also been stories about COVID-19 in NATO's battle group in Latvia, about the US forces in Poland. I want to say none of this is true. And this just shows the importance of continued vigilance. So at NATO, we are monitoring this information and propaganda campaigns. We are countering false narratives with facts, with our values, with our concrete actions. And that all demonstrates NATO's readiness and solidarity. NATO continues to work with all allies and partners to identify, expose, and counter disinformation. That's what we will do also in the future. We work closely with the EU on this issue. And in my new position as a head of public diplomacy division at NATO, I intend to continue and strengthen this cooperation with the EU institutions especially when it comes to countering this information. So no one really was able to foresee this pandemic and no one can foresee the next crisis. So in increased situational awareness is something that helps us to see what is ahead and we have to strengthen it. Uh, but for crises that nobody can foresee, we have to be agile, flexible, prepared, for the unexpected. That is what NATO strives to be. And that is how we build resilience. So Andrew, Commissioner, I will stop here and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, Vice President, the floor is yours. I think you are muted. Yes. So now it's better. You can yes. hear me. <laughs> Thank you.
No, thank you very much. Uh, at first and foremost, uh, good afternoon to everyone. And I really uh, would like uh, to thank the uh, Aspen Institute uh, in uh, Romania, the German Marshall Fund for uh, organizing this event and for uh, inviting me to share the uh, uh, thoughts with this distinguished audience. And uh, as I have seen quite a few uh, participants at first, I really would like to sincerely congratulate uh, uh, to uh, Ambassador Baiba Broje to her very uh, high level position in the NATO. Uh, and I also uh, would like to congratulate my very good uh, friend Mircea uh, Joanna for his appointment to be Deputy Secretary General of NATO because uh, we are going back uh, uh, for many years and I still remember that it was Mircea who actually invited me and welcomed me for the first time in Aspen Institute to Romania. So it's nice to be in such a uh, great company and of course to discuss a uh, very important uh, topic of uh, resilience, uh, foresight and of course uh, how to cope uh, with the uh, current uh, uh, crisis. I very much appreciate uh, uh, the words of uh, Ambassador uh, Broje about the, the importance of the cooperation between the EU and, I, and NATO. Uh, we are actually thinking the same because uh, many of the aspects uh, we will be dealing with, uh, I believe that our two uh, organizations and institutions could be very much uh, complementary, not only on tackling the disinformation to which I will come in a moment, but also in uh, uh, comparing our concepts uh, of uh, resilience. We are, of course, going to invest a lot of efforts and as I said in a second, uh, quite a lot of money in making sure that our member states, our economies and the whole European Union would be much more resilient and better prepared, not only for future uh, crises, but uh, for the challenges of the uh, 21st uh, centuries. If we look back uh, uh, into uh, of this last uh, few months uh, and uh, just try to draw the first lessons uh, from the COVID uh, night in crisis. I mean, um, of course, uh, the first conclusions are very obvious. This is uh, uh, most probably the biggest uh, shock which hit uh, our people, uh, our country since Second World uh, War. It has uh, dramatic impact uh, on our economy, on our uh, lifestyle, on our society, and uh, also on the way how we govern uh, in uh, all uh, countries uh, around uh, the world. I mean, uh, when I was looking through the different analyses and articles, I think that uh, political scientists are agreeing on one thing, that uh, the COVID was something like the accelerator of the, of the challenges and trends, which have been already with us, but uh, now we see them in uh, much uh, bigger vividity, in much more striking colors, and uh, they require much uh, more urgent uh, action than we just thought uh, couple of uh, weeks ago. Let's not forget that all the drama started sometime late January, early February, and now we are still even before the summer. So that was the, the, the dramatic, uh, uh, dramatic period of time in which uh, so many things uh, uh, have uh, changed. This crisis uh, brought the things which have been dramatically negative, but there have been also some positive uh, uh, elements. Uh, I think that on the one hand, uh, we have seen that uh, this twin digital and the green uh, transition is clearly being accelerated uh, uh, by uh, this crisis. The people realize that, this, uh, that the sky is bluer, that uh, the trees are greener, that the air is cleaner, and uh, that simply all, uh, that uh, we can also have a different style of life uh, as we had uh, before. We never relied so much on the digital communication uh, like uh, right now. And I think all of us went uh, through some kind of crash course uh, in being able to use Zoom, Skype, and all these technologies, which many of us didn't use so often before. And I think it will change the way how we cooperate, how we communicate, and uh, I think how we travel, because I'm sure that a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of possibilities uh, provided by the digital means of communication would, repl would replace a lot of, uh, a lot of travel. At the same time, I think that also, especially in, uh, in, in many parts of, of Europe, the trust in public institutions was reinvigorated because I think that uh, despite the initial drama and uh, enormous human cost, uh, I think that uh, our societies proved uh, that we prefer transparency. We want to know what is happening and we know how to, how to, deal, how to deal with the crisis. And I also would underline the fact that uh, what in the end will prevail over this virus would be this sense of collective responsibility 
and solidarity to each other. And not only people to people, but uh, as I will explain in a second, also countries to countries, and I would say the continents to continents uh, as well. On the other hand, uh, of course, uh, there is a clear need, as uh, Ambassador Braz just mentioned, uh, uh, need to learn and integrate uh, the lessons uh, from the crisis. I think that for us in Europe, it means that we need to uh, dramatically strengthen the European uh, strategic autonomy in uh, key areas, especially in the face of uh, rising geopolitical and uh, uh, trade uh, tensions. We also uh, have seen that also this crisis was used for, uh, for um, organizing uh, some further attacks on multilateralism and international institutions. And uh, there is also a lot of pressure which is being put on our democracies, by the way, as it was very well explained uh, by Baiba, and this is the disinformation and a, and a spread uh, of uh, uh, fake news. So I think that um, to overcome uh, the crisis uh, and to respond to this really new and changing world, it would be vital that uh, we would uh, carry out uh, honest assessment on our shortcomings, what has worked, uh, what didn't, and what we need uh, to change. And I think that we have to uh, do our utmost to transform our vulnerabilities uh, into the uh, opportunities and that would be the task of this European Commission to make sure that we would emerge uh, from the recovery uh, from this recovery period with more resilient uh, union. How we want to achieve that I think that we sent very clear signals just uh, this Wednesday because we presented very ambitious uh, and I would say far-reaching and transformative uh, recovery uh, package. We presented it as a next uh, uh, generation EU because we know that now we have to lay the founding stone for, uh, for, the, for the EU, for the next generation, for the EU, which would be well prepared for this new post-COVID uh, uh, world and economy of the 21st uh, century. What we did was to propose uh, the, the, the seven years budget and short-term recovery instrument uh, in the sum of 1.85 trillion of euros and this comes on top of uh, the loans of 540 billion which been already uh, agreed uh, by the EU institutions uh, and we can we should still bear in mind that uh, quite enormous uh, economic and financial assistance was provided already by the member states in the in the form of the state aid so comparing of the level of assistance and investment to the European GDP. I think we, we are doing our homework, but of course what would be even most important is how we would invest the money, what would be the project and how transformative we would be in our investment effort and in our, uh, in, uh, our work uh, in, the coming, in the coming months um, and years. I believe that uh, we can use this uh, uh, opportunity for true leap forward, where we want to make sure that the uh, European Union uh, would remain one of the top three economies uh, uh, in this world, not only in this decade, but uh, in the post-2030 world as well. We want to remain key global actor, which would continue to be responsible to the environment, uh, which, would be, which would be the Union with a strong uh, social values and working social models. And we, of course, want uh, to remain to be the strong advocate uh, of multilateral uh, order and uh, rules-based uh, system, because I believe that, that our world, especially the 21st century, really need all these uh, uh, ingredients. If it comes uh, to, I would say, more uh, concrete uh, homework uh, here uh, in Europe, I was already talking about the growth uh, based on the green and digital transition, but we are definitely going to pay much more attention to the resilience so we would be better prepared uh, for the future shocks. And I also would like to thank uh, Romania for being the first country to host uh, uh, the strategic stock stockpile of medical uh, equipment, uh, which we will be funding from the European budget to make sure that uh, if uh, 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 the crisis of this type would re-emerge, we would be much better prepared if it comes to medical equipment, protective gear and all the, uh, all the necessary medical supplies, uh, which we didn't have at the beginning of this year at appropriate quantities and, 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 and which created uh, a lot of uh, 
problems at the beginning uh, of the, the crisis. I think that uh, if I should draw such a quick lesson, it's quite obvious that resilience would become such a strategic compass for the uh, policy making. And we definitely uh, would use this approach to make sure that uh, we will be achieving much more in the area of technological sovereignty, strategic autonomy, and that we uh, uh, would be doing our utmost to boost the transformative resilience of our societies using this 360 uh, degree uh, systemic uh, uh, approach. And I know that uh, uh, for every effort and assessment, you also need a good uh, criteria. So we are working on a number of resilience indicators which we want to introduce into our policy making and uh, which would also help us to monitor the uh, the progress uh, achieved. And I know that this is something what NATO is working on as well. And uh, therefore, I uh, believe that uh, what would be very important in the future, that we can compare the notes, we can, uh, uh, we can um, um, exchange the, the, the information, how you are uh, progressing with your resilience assessment, with the self-assessment which will be done by the member states and how we will be proceeding with uh, our um, uh, managing not only of the twin uh, industrial revolution, but also developing this new resilience uh, concept. On uh, the, this information, I think we would have a more opportunity to debate it in the upcoming discussion. Here again, this is completely new, uh, new ball game. Uh, at this time, I will just say one uh, figure that we are monitoring this very carefully and we have seen during this uh, COVID crisis that there are 2,700 uh, articles containing potential disinformation uh, uh, identified daily. So on daily basis, we have almost 3,000 uh, pieces of information which are scaring people, which are misinforming people and which are very often uh, aimed at uh, weakening our democratic systems uh, in Europe. And that, I think, is the common task where we can cooperate very closely with NATO, with the NGO sectors, and with all those who would like to, to help us to make sure that our citizens are properly informed. So thank you very much for this uh, possibility to start with opening remar remarks. I believe that uh, we can continue our discussions after there will be uh, uh, first uh, question posed to, uh, to uh, Ambassador and myself. Thank you very much, Vice President. Uh, uh, before we start the Q&A session, I would like to invite all our participants to send us additional questions. Some have already arrived by email, uh, so we're going to echo these um, as well. Uh, so what I would like to start with uh, the discussion with, uh, and, and, and both my guests have actually mentioned that uh, idea, is the concept of resilience. So I have a feeling that over the last few months, the concept of resilience has developed, has changed somehow. Could you tell me how you see the concept developing? And uh, I will give floor to both guests who want to answer this question first. Maros, you want to go first? <laughs> I, think, I think ladies first, you know, so... <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the concept of resilience, you know, first, when you think about it, uh, probably everybody, uh, anybody can interpret it in their own way. Uh, NATO as organization, as always, has very concrete parameters. How does it benefit our collective mission, uh, both to defend and deter, deter uh, manage crisis and, and cooperate with partners and thus increase the uh, security globally? So um, that's why there are the seven baseline parameters that have been drawn up and uh, that deals both with uh, making sure there is government continuity, there is uh, services continuity to the population, that our health services are able to deal with, uh, with health crisis, uh, that there are uh, communication networks that are resilient. So those are you know, very substantive uh, uh, parameters and through them, with each and every ally, uh, we work uh, together, uh, adapting to their national uh, requirements and circumstances, uh, how to do it the best to, to benefit uh, their resilience. And EU is very complementary in this respect. What the EU has done through its regulatory and budgetary 
uh, means and, and tools uh, does benefit uh, all democracies uh, that are uh, members both of the EU and NATO, but also beyond our partners and, and friends. Thank you. Thank you very much. I can also very well elaborate, uh, elaborate on, uh, uh, on uh, what Baiba just uh, uh, said, because we also would like to approach the, the concept of uh, resilience from this multi-dimensional uh, perspective, because I believe that we have to look at the wider, uh, wider picture, making sure that we would have a proper criteria from the, uh, from the point of view of uh, resilience in the field of uh, sustainability, social uh, aspects of our life, the functioning uh, democracy, and I would say these two aspects, which I uh, make the reference just a minute ago, and this is uh, uh, strategic autonomy and technological sovereignty. Uh, and I have to also reveal the little secret, when uh, we've been planning our strategic documents uh, the last year and preparing the, the Commission's work program, what we've been focusing on was how to transform this green and uh, uh, digital uh, twin revolution into the new growth uh, strategy of the of the European Union, and it, that was the that was the basic concept. And we we expected this would be the, the the pillar upon which we want to modernize the European economy and European society. Of course, after this crisis and the lessons learned, we we learned very quickly that we have to add third very important element, and this is uh, actually the resilience of our societies, uh, of our economies, and of our democracies. I mean. Um, to be quite honest, for many of us, it was a big surprise where we, in the, uh, where we are getting from uh, the basic medicaments like, like paracetamol. We, we learned that uh, the global value chains probably, uh, um, probably de uh, been developed in a way that they're a little bit too long, that uh, we are somehow missing the, the key parts uh, for some uh, production of the strategic materials uh, in Europe. And uh, as you know, I was uh, dealing before that with uh, energy security and uh, it reminded me a little bit uh, how important it was to diversify the, the, the sources of supply and I think that uh, this is the lessons which we can also use in the in the current crisis when, when we would be mapping our vulnerabilities when we be looking what uh, to do with the global value, uh, value chains which needs to be let's say more diversified which needs to be shortened or where we would have to reshore some of the production of the key products like for example uh, uh, medicaments or uh, medical uh, appliances uh, here in Europe just to be sure that uh, in uh, whatever circumstances uh, our citizens would be well taken uh, uh, care of. We see how the new raw materials are becoming the, as critical as the gas and oil was let's say 10 years ago, and, uh, uh, and uh, more we are leaning towards uh, greener uh, Europe, more we discover that uh, for wind power, for solar power, for, uh, for smart network, you simply need uh, the, 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 the raw materials uh, uh, which are all coming from Asia, from Africa, and therefore we are preparing this new raw materials strategy because we see how it becomes uh, how it, uh, how it becomes uh, strategically important, not, not only for our green, but also for our digital transition. So, so these are, I would say, the lessons learned from uh, these uh, few weeks and, and months, and therefore we would need uh, to be much more strong in that aspect. Two years ago, I, uh, I proposed that we should in Europe establish European Battery Alliance. And then the reason for that was that I clearly have seen that with our, with our developments toward smarter, cleaner uh, mobility, uh, we have more and more of the electric scooters, almost all electric buses, uh, and uh, uh, more and more electric bicycles, uh, again, coming from Asia, mostly from China. You have more and more personal cars, which are electric, which have been very much a preferred option for many municipalities, for airports, coming from the destination. So it was quite obvious that if Europe wants to continue to produce best cars in the world, in this case, it, they will have to be clean cars. We have to go gradually to more battery, uh, electric, hybrid type of, uh, of, of personal vehicles and that we need to be well prepared for it. What, we, what did we discover? We discovered that we almost do not manufacture the batteries in Europe. And I'm, I'm very glad that I managed to convince my, my colleagues in the commission and 
especially our competition uh, commissioner uh, Margaret Vestager was a great delight because we clearly realized that this is kind of uh, uh, a market error that we simply cannot be uh, almost 100% reliable on batteries coming from outside because we need them for cars, we need them for buses, we need them for bicycles, we need them for power plants. And uh, we invested a lot in creating this new value chain in Europe. And I'm glad to say that just within two years, we managed to channel more than 100 billion of investments. And now we have very strong ecosystem, which uh, will guarantee the autonomy of Europe in this very important segment. And I'm mentioning this example, not only because I know it well, but because this is the proof that within two years, you can, you can, you can completely change the game. So we just need to have a good priorities. We need to really focus uh, our minds on what is important, what is necessary, get the support from the, from the industry, get the support for the key political actors and from the society, and you can achieve the change and the transformation. And therefore, I think now the task ahead of us would be what are the sectors, what are the areas where we need to be so strong in the coming years and months and to use the same vigor, some energy, I would say the same blueprint, how to overcome the shortcomings which we discovered over the uh, last uh, few weeks. Thank you. So we, we, have, we have seen that uh, uh, quite a few things have sped up actually recently. But I, I, when I was talking about the concept, I was also thinking about how to communicate it to the general public because we are speaking about the concept of resilience on a sort of high level, uh, but uh, how to communicate, how to prepare all the citizens or all, all our citizens to understand what resilience means? It's an open question. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, what we have seen uh, from the crisis and one of the lessons learned will be that societies have become much more resilient and there is much more uh, participation of the civil society, of media, of trusted information sources, of uh, independent uh, various uh, groups in the whole effort. Uh, so, for example, private businesses have been in the forefront to create uh, various uh, innovative solutions uh, of both informing citizens about the current situation or even designing new apps uh, through a variety of means of uh, producing uh, new types of medical equipment uh, that startups have done. So there are, I think uh, it has given much more participation to the whole of society in the feelings that this is our joint, very joint effort. And again, here, uh, maintaining that feeling and maintaining uh, the ability uh, to, to participate in the joint effort, I think, is what makes our, our society stronger and thus more resilient. Of course, as for NATO, uh, quite clearly, we had to continue to be providing the defense and deterrence, and we were able to do that throughout the crisis. So all the stories about, you know, all types of uh, NATO's weaknesses actually didn't prove to be true. And we have been able also to show that we can deliver during the crisis. So military planes were flying to help the civilian hospitals. The military was providing uh, equipment, military uh, personnel and medics were providing very uh, practical help to a variety of places. Uh, the logisticians, military logisticians were helping to build uh, civilian hospitals. So there has been also this uh, genuine uh, engagement between civilian and military uh, sectors uh, within all countries. Vice President. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for this, for this question. I think it's, it's, it's very important and also how you, uh, the way how you put it because the resilience clearly will be the buzzword and priority for, uh, for, many, for, many, years, uh, for many years to come. And uh, what we in the EU are doing right now is that we want uh, to put, I would say, the concrete number and concrete content uh, uh, behind uh, the concept of resilience. So I would say the biggest part of uh, this new uh, financial instrument, which we proposed on Wednesday, uh, is called actually Recovery and Resilient uh, Resilience Facility. And we are going to channel through this uh, facility 560 billion euros, which is a, a lot of money. And of course, uh, we want uh, to, to make sure that we'll be working very closely with our member states so they would, uh, so they would prepare the recovery uh, plans. And it would be kind of self-assessment as, as NATO is doing. So if we are 
talking about, I would say, the, the, the most uh, sensitive issue right now, which was uh, the, the health uh, uh, sector. So I think that a uh, big part of this money will go to support uh, the reform of the, of the health sectors in our member states. What are the lessons learned? What did we, what did we miss? Uh, do we have uh, hospitals ready? Do we have medical personnel properly trained? Do we have the equipment uh, we need for this type of, uh, of uh, pandemics? And uh, uh, we would like to, to hear from the member states uh, uh, what, what are their plans, what they want to do. We would give them the best possible advice and then uh, uh, we would be ready to, to fund uh, such a, a reforms in the member states. And this would go, uh, of course, in all other uh, areas uh, which I which I mentioned before the proper training for the new skills which would be required on on labor market I mean all that uh, lessons learned for making sure that in economy in industry we will be much more self-sufficient uh, than before I think that uh, uh, we should take this topic as one of the the uh, theme for the discussion in the conference on future of Europe which we are hopefully uh being opening in uh, in the autumn of this year because i'm sure that uh, this crisis uh, uh, brought a lot of issues a lot of question marks which the citizens would like to uh, discuss with uh, the uh, policy makers and uh, on uh, my behalf i can tell you that our uh, first uh, ever annual foresight report will be very much focused exactly on the concept of resilience and how we want to develop it in the European Union. So uh, at the beginning in, in your opening speeches, uh, you both mentioned, uh, you know, disinformation, and I would like to devote uh, some time to, of our discussion to, to that topic. So there's a there's a few different things uh, here. On the one hand, we have plenty of different uh, conspiracy theories. After the uh, the outbreak of, of the pandemic, uh, there was a huge uh, explosion of those. Uh, at the same time, we have governments, uh, and you know, telling journalists to report only uh, what is uh, what is being said uh, during official uh, press conferences, forbidding uh, them from speaking, you know, to medical personnel. Yet uh, another problem is uh, where you know where we see governments saying that uh, you know the, the word coronavirus should be entirely banned. Uh, the, for example, the Brazilian president said that you know coronavirus is actually a, uh, a fantasy. Uh, we we of course have the issue of non uh, non state actors and uh, and all the uh, influence uh, operations. So if we if we look at uh, an individual person who actually gets their information their news from a uh, you know, f Facebook feed, uh, they're overwhelmed with this, you know, mix of information, how to educate them. We were talking also about the 2,700, you know, uh, wrong news that we uh, are able to identify on a daily basis. How can a person who, who wants to learn what the situation is like actually uh, learn that? That's a very long and complex question, I know. Um, if I may, um, I think that uh, type of effort, uh, we have to look at it at the systemic level. Uh, we are all democracies, so we are all committed to free media, independent media, and, and there are various uh, both legal and practical instruments how, how to ensure that uh, media has all these uh, rights, but also obligations. And uh, systemically, both for the NATO and I also suggest for the EU, it's in our interests that the quality media and in this quality independent free media uh, has uh, a very strong role in our societies that it does provide, uh, especially in the times of crisis, this reliable information to our citizens. Uh, from what we have seen, uh, the crisis has been a difficult time for the media, so uh, it clearly shows that the media landscape can actually, the ownership and, and the circulation, everything can change. So there will be some changes and it will be up to the governments to see whether uh, they can support this variety uh, of, of media landscape uh, and continue its existence. 
From other hand, uh, obviously, it's again within the government's uh, hands to think how uh, we can ensure that our citizens are able and willing uh, to understand uh, what is hostile information coming to them, what are conspiracy theories, uh, how to check them. And it's also for the NATO and for the governments, when they see this information, to immediately call it out and counter it with facts. So I would say these, these three pillars, uh, both having you know, free independent uh, media that provides quality information, having citizens uh, who understand uh, that they are challenged and that there are uh, threats uh, out there and they are able and willing to, to uh, uh, sort out what to do about it. And then, uh, of course, when there is disinformation, when there is propaganda uh, and there are challenges by external actors or, or adversaries that there is organizations and governments that call it out right away and, and uh, tell what it is. Yeah, and I, I just would uh, add a couple of more elements. I think what is very important uh, in uh, this type of crisis is, is also the personal example of the leaders, of the, of the politicians, how they behave uh, during the, the, the crisis, how they can convince uh, the, the populations to be, to be responsible, to respect uh, the rules and to minimize uh, the exposure, in this case, to, to pandemic. And I think this is irreplaceable, simply responsible behavior of the political leaders is uh, always the, the key element how to tackle uh, any crisis. Uh, uh, second, I would say such a systemic issue is very much linked with the, with the rule of law. We have seen that almost in every uh, member state, definitely in the EU, but I would say it was such a global phenomenon that the government uh, introduced uh, or enacted uh, emergency laws. And here again, very much depends on the political, uh, political leadership, how you handled the situation, how much uh, you used uh, your, your, your powers, how did you uh, navigate uh, even in this difficult situation and state within the democratic uh, democratic boundaries and uh, this is something what we are currently assessing also on the EU level and it would be uh, the subject of uh, such assessment for all EU member states which we want to uh, present uh, in the autumn but one thing which we want to do earlier and we planned it for June and it was exactly spurred by this uh, unbelievable wave of this, this information. Uh, this is uh, uh, the EU action plan against uh, this information which we want to adopt already most probably in July. So we are accelerating our efforts here because uh, Again, there is a lot of uh, things to learn uh, from the crisis in some, uh, in some aspect, uh, that agreement, that understanding, that uh, code of practice on this information, which we, um, uh, which we agreed upon with a key social media platform till certain extent uh, level worked quite well. But we see that uh, there is still a lot to be done and that uh, and that line uh, between uh, the proper information and censorship is very, very fine. So that would be very delicate uh, uh, balance to find where we again have to uh, also rely a lot on the responsibility of this uh, social media platform, uh, what kind of uh, information uh, would be spread and how can we, uh, how can we actually approach uh, this huge topic uh, uh, with uh, our clear democratic priorities like the freedom of speech, freedom of information, but at the same time, we'll be fighting disinformation. We've been faced with this phenomenon in the EU and uh, I, I think in NATO it's the same already uh, for quite some time. We started to address it in more systemic uh, way already in 2015 when uh, we established the first uh, East Stratcom task force and then it was developed into the into the current rapid uh, alert system and different uh, different platforms, but still I think uh, that that would be the room uh, for for cooperation, for sharing the, the practices, and I would say also for making uh, this uh, uh, this information analytics more available uh, to to our to our citizens, because we know that this information exists, we know that this analysis is available, we know that we put it uh, online. 
but I'm sure that a huge and overwhelming majority of our citizens uh, is still not aware that uh, there is such a website, that there is such a link where you can check if uh, some of this uh, uh, most frequent and more present hoax uh, uh, from the social media platform are properly analyzed and, and discredited. And I think that here we would need to find a way how to um, reach to more, reach out to more citizens just with the information. If you have a doubt or if it sounds strange, there is a web link, there is a possibility uh, to, to do some fact checking and that there are actually a lot of very bright people who did it for you so we would be properly informed. And the last point I totally uh, subscribe to what Baiba just said, we have to invest a lot in a, in a young generation actually from the age where, where they are starting to be active on the social media platform to be aware that not everything what is there is true, that a lot of, of uh, uh, you know, posts try to manipulate them, just to be a little bit, uh, um, let's say, more mature to be on this platform and to be able to distinguish the, the, the real information from the, from the fake news, to be simply uh, more vigilant about the information which is brought to them by uh, this uh, social media. So it would be, again, such a huge societal task. So I will relate to my previous question, and uh, we actually got a, a question from one of the um, uh, participants. Uh, so the question is, uh, what kind of actions are planned, if, there are, if they are planned, uh, against, uh, I won't name the, the news channel, but uh, news channels that uh, constantly uh, you know, spread fake news, and, and we know there are quite, there are quite a few of those. Uh, does the does NATO or the European Commission plan any any uh, action against uh, such uh, media outlets? I will Again, I question. will ask Maros to go first with <laughs> with regard to yeah. the actions uh, against media channels. Yeah, this is I think uh, of course uh, one of that uh, very sensitive issue where we where uh, you still want uh, the media to be true, uh, to be objective, and at the same time, you do not want uh, to create some kind of some kind of European or global censorship. So this is, I would say, the fine line we have to uh, find and uh, we have to we have to uh, work on. I think that uh, what uh, should be the, the first steps is the, that uh, uh, I think the issue of the uh, the social media platform is 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 uh, very very crucial, and I think we are still looking for the way what would be the best way. Uh, best way to, to regulate. We've been working through the, let's say, voluntary code of conduct. Now it's a question to assess if it was enough or if we need uh, to do something something more. If it comes to uh, media as such, uh, there is already quite uh, uh, developed leg legislations and the responsibility of publishers and so on and so forth. But again, I think in this uh, fast uh, running world, uh, the, 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 the question is, you know, how long it takes very often for the legal remedies uh, or uh, to kick in to correct uh, uh, the informations which are not true or which, which could be which could be harmful so all this i think would uh, need uh, to be subject to the further assessment and we want to tackle it in our uh, european democracy action plan where of course this would be one of the very sensitive topics where i think we need to find the, the right approach uh, how to how to deal with also those who are deliberately deli deliberately uh, misleading and uh, disinforming the, the citizens. We do not want to suppress uh, the variety of options or freedom of expressions or or the democratic discussions, but we would need to find more efficient tools to tackle disinformation, lies, and and harmful content. And and, and that would be, I think, the challenge which would be ahead of uh, both of us. Mm. Ambassador, I think um, I think I can only agree to to what Marsh has said uh, with regard. You know that there are instruments and there are means how to deal in our democratic countries with those actors that violate uh, these laws. So the regulators, obviously, we have regulators in each and every country, and if they uh, sees that there are violations of uh, the rules and laws that regards the free speech and provision of, of information, they can deal with it as a first, uh, first step. 
And uh, there is, of course, uh, further steps that can be done with regard to at the European level and the, so on and so forth. But we have to separate, uh, certainly. There are attacks, targeted attacks by external actors. So it's not just disinformation per se. Those are targeted attacks and they are part of subversive operations. And they have been around for a long time. Uh, they have changed, uh, developed, uh, and, and those tools involve a variety of expressions. You can uh, see the growth of cyber attacks and all types of uh, uh, cyber uh, activities during the crisis that suddenly uh, they're much more active. So hack to leak and hack to steal and everything around that really grew. Uh, so the hybrid threats are not just that's why they are called hybrids they have a variety of expressions and um, these targeted attacks uh, we have to be very aware at uh, the government level at the military at our security service levels that uh, they will continue they are going to change the shape and the form but they are not going to disappear and this is where we have to very straightforwardly call out and say this is we know what is going on and this is cyber attack or disinformation and uh, warn our citizens that this is what is happening. Uh, an entirely different level are various conspiracy theories, misperceptions, uh, different uh, ways of expressing oneself's opinions. And that is part of the space which is called freedom of speech. And there, uh, unless we see really hostile behavior uh, is very difficult to counter it. And there really is the onus of responsibility goes to reliable media, uh, quality independent media that has to take a lot of responsibility on itself to investigate and, and to tell those stories. A lot goes on the uh, consumer groups, on the civil society, and uh, of course, also to the education sector where, where we as democratic countries do have to tell our children uh, and, and not only children, the whole society is that this is what is happening and have to, have to ask for a critical view on that. So, but that is a different type of activity, obviously. Now, if, uh, you, if, our, if sure. we allow just, just uh, two, more, two more points, I think Baiba led, led me to it, I mean, I think the, the last European election been actually the, the first occasion where we as a EU had to adopt the set of measures uh, uh, to make sure that uh, the European Parliament elections, uh, um, the European par Parliament elections uh, 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 would, be, would be free, uh, would be uh, uh, without any interference through this, uh, I would say, hybrid, hybrid means. And uh, we had to develop quite elaborate uh, system of cooperation with uh, different uh, internet platforms uh, and uh, to agree with them regular monitoring to, to make sure that uh, there will be no uh, interference into, into the process of the European election. I mean, this time, this time we succeeded, but I'm sure that this would be something which would be such an ongoing uh, task for all of us to make sure that we would protect the democratic uh, character of, uh, of the elections themselves. And then, of course, there is some more even subtle uh, issue, which is, uh, again, uh, something where we would have to deal more with uh, educating, especially the, the younger uh, generation of this new world of the social media, where uh, very often through the skillful campaigns, you can lock the people in some kind of uh, ideological uh, or uh, political views bubbles, where uh, the, the the news feed to the uh, to the user of the social media platform is very much filtered uh, by the algorithms and, in worst case, by some concrete uh, uh, people who just simply want to influence the behavior of the people, or in the election booth, or I would say in the in the in the in the political life. And this is something which is a completely new area where uh, I think we are just uh, trying to comprehend what is the scale uh, of uh, the influence of uh, this, this type uh, uh, of, uh, let's call it openly, um, uh, manipulation uh, of the opinion. And I think that would be the, the, the task of the, of, the, of, the, of the next generation of politicians how to, and the regulators how to deal uh, with uh, these new ways, how to impact or influence uh, the election results. 
So uh, I, I have a question regarding um, independent media, and we as we as an organization are are doing our best to actually empower and educate, especially those uh, independent media outlets, uh, how to uh, deliver uh, the the right information. How can we empower altogether, uh, you know, those in, in independent media to 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 learn and and uh, deliver that you know legitimate information and news. Um, I think, again, as far as NATO is concerned, uh, our duty and obligation is to put out the information that is factual and that doesn't give rise to some type of doubt about uh, what NATO is saying or doing. Uh, so I think that is step one, that uh, we work with, with partners in media, with journalists, with social media, and we provide them uh, what we can, uh, and we are factual about both what we are doing, but also what others are doing to us. When we see disinformation, when we see lies, we call it out. All right. Um, then at the national level, obviously, what the governments do, that's uh, a different aspect. There are a variety of uh, practices that we have seen. There are governments who have established, uh, for example, special funds where they sort of give uh, money uh, to, the, to the sort of media fund, which is then decided by the journalists and academicians themselves to which projects that media does that are investigative media that should be supported. Uh, there are uh, regulatory uh, various uh, actions that have been seen. So that's again at the, at the government level, that is something where uh, probably at the times of the crisis, we have to be uh, or, or we can be quite flexible in how we ensure that the free and independent media continues, continues to work. And especially the smaller ones, uh, the ones in the countryside, the regional media and so on, uh, which is important for providing that proximity of information to the people and outside of the big cities. Yeah, and I and I, I just would add a couple of uh, couple of points. I think uh, uh, what would be the most important, first and foremost, to create uh, the good environment for uh, independent uh, journalism. So I think we we uh, we have to uh, also bear in mind that also in uh, this uh, post let's call it post COVID uh, uh, period uh, that these are especially the. Uh, the paper uh, media, the print media, which would go through uh, very uh, difficult uh, economic uh, moments. And I think that this was just spur that most more and more information will be spread among the people through the digital media. Therefore, I think we would have to pay even more attention uh, to the to the digital platforms. But I think that we have to support uh, the the independent uh, uh, media boards we have to support uh, all uh, those who are involved in investigative journalism i think that we should uh, boost uh, the capacity uh, of our institutions but also of independent journalists for fast checking and i would say rapid uh, reactions so we, we see that there is a hoax there is a mystery there, there, there should be some kind of um, official and also semi-official journalist uh, base uh, 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 level of, of contacts which would be able to immediately attack uh, the, the dangerous uh, hoax and, 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 uh, and misinformation with, uh, with the proper information. So I think this would be something upon which we have to focus and then of course uh, the high quality journalism and 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 and, and good journalists and uh, to, to provide the the, su the support uh, they uh, they would require and to also respect how they want to do it because uh, um, from one way we hear that they are in a, uh, economic distress from other way they do not want to be helped financially because it could uh, create the perception that we are kind of limiting the, the freedom and independence. So it's again something which has to be developed uh, closely uh, with, the, with the media, with the, with the journalists. But I think that support for creating environment for independent high quality journalism and helping them with our analytical capacities uh, uh, to fight uh, the disinformation, misinformation and hoax that probably would the, be the, the best recipes. So my final question for today, uh, we're approaching the end of the, the session, 
uh, comes from one of our participants. Has the crisis accelerated the EU-NATO institutional cooperation? If so, how? And how are the, oh, what are the lessons learned on how the EU and NATO can work together better? Um, I can say on our behalf that yes, absolutely, it has uh, never been closer. It's it's quite incredible to see uh, how closely we work, and uh, I can say that uh, in my field of work, which is uh, both the information and and uh, communication services, but I also know it's in other parts of NATO. Uh, both staff to staff relationships, there are you know uh, weekly coordination online meetings on a variety of issues, both the uh, topicalities at that moment, but also sharing information. There are uh, also more creative ideas how we can work together in partner countries. Uh, it's all there. And especially uh, against these hyper, uh, hybrid threats, such as hybrids, such as informational operations and, and uh, attacks against our societies. And what the EU will be doing on military mobility uh, in the next budget, of course, is very important. So we will be uh, watching with interest and great support uh, to the, the implementation of, of these projects. Vice President? Yeah, I, I can just uh, echo what Baiba just said, because uh, I think that during this uh, last uh, few, few weeks and months, uh, we have seen that uh, uh, we could be of enormous uh, help to each other. We have seen uh, uh, the flights being organized to transport the EU citizens back home. We have seen the military flights transporting the medicine. We have seen military hospitals helping the, the patients from, from, uh, another, from another country. And uh, we have seen uh, that the military doctors and health professionals have been, been helping in, uh, in, in hospitals, in, in, in field, uh, really tackling the, the, the the pandemic. So I think that this clearly has shown that uh, both institutions and organizations have a lot to offer and uh, definitely can achieve much more if they would uh, cooperate uh, uh, very, very closely. And as you know, uh, we in the European Union also realize that what would be expected uh, in the future is that we would be uh, much more robust also in the segment of, uh, of common defense. We just uh, creating DG defense where we also want to see how we can with the uh, pooled resources, uh, uh, develop uh, better preparedness, and uh, of course to 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 increase the also military capabilities of our of our member states, who in big parts are also the member states of NATO. So there is a lot of uh, uh, compatibility, and uh, and I'm sure that it would be very useful in the in the future. And then the projects like uh, the infrastructure for. Uh, the, the military transport and other other projects, I think, would be of, uh, I would say, such a strategic importance in the long run. Currently, uh, what uh, we are discussing and where I think we really would uh, could be uh, the inspirations uh, uh, to each other, this is how we would deal with the issue of uh, resilience. I, with a great interest, uh, heard and studied uh, the approach uh, of the NATO, the seven criteria, process of self-assessment, possible pilot projects in making sure that uh, the, the, the member states uh, would be focusing on the vulnerability, vulnerabilities jointly identified. And, uh, uh, and this is done from, let's say, military NATO perspective. And of course, uh, we are developing the concept which would, be, which would be larger, which would concern economy, which would concern the, the society, sustainability, and of course, the the, the quality of our democratic uh, system across the EU. So let's say our dashboard of uh, resilience indicators would be larger, but we also want to work very closely with our uh, member states uh, uh, to develop their recovery plans, to identify the vulnerabilities uh, and to work together on making sure that uh, they would be much more resilient uh, than in the past. And I think this is joint uh, uh, wish joint effort, uh, joint priority for the NATO and, and the EU. And uh, we are currently brainstorming uh, together with our NATO colleagues how to do it better. And I hope that it would be one of the, the topics uh, for the discussions where the president of the European Commission would meet uh, uh, with the secretary general of the, of the, of the NATO. Because, uh, as you know, Ursula von der Leyen, as a former defense minister, she knows the NATO organization very well. 
and I'm sure that this will just create uh, further opportunities where we can consider what type of cooperation and what type of complementarity we would like to focus upon. So despite social distancing, the, the two organizations are actually working closer uh, together. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, and uh, thank you very much, Vice President. It's been a pleasure uh, to chair this session. Uh, I hope the participants have enjoyed it, and so have you. Thank you very thank much. You, Andrew. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Vice President. thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Ambassador. All the best. Thank you for the Bye -bye. invitation. Bye-bye. Thank you.